Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so are you ready to put 2022 behind you? I am, but not really for any major negative reasons. I'm just ready to get the next year started and all the potential it brings for me personally and professionally. And to close out 2022, I've got a pretty eclectic group of sparkling wines to review. Two I purchased and one was given to me by one of my distributor friends. So let's get this, so let's get this party started. Uh, real quick, a rare daytime recording. So you might see some sunlight coming through because I, I do record by windows, even though the blinds are there. Anyway, to start things off, let's go somewhere most of you only think about in terms of beer, tequila, and mezcal. Mexico. Did you know that Mexico is home of the continuously op the oldest continuously operating winery in the Americas? I mean, the whole of Americas, all of them. Yeah, Mexico. It's called Casa Medero. It was founded in 1597. In fact, no other New World winery is older than that that I know of. The, America, uh, the, the closest outside the Americas is South Africa, with the Dutch bringing viticulture to Cape Town in the 1650s. So it was originally called Hacienda San Lorenzo until 1893 when Don Evaristo Madero bought the property. And while I'm not reviewing any wines from them, you should check them out. Yeah, I know, a little bit of a tease there. Anyway, viticulture was started by the Spanish in the Americas before any other New World country. Sometime after 1521, Hernán Cortés, yeah, the famous or I guess more correctly infamous conquistador, ordered the planting of grapevines throughout New Spain after he and his soldiers ran out of the wine they brought with them. About a hundred years after Casamadero was founded, Charles II of Spain decided in 1699 to prohibit the making of wine in Spain's colonies because well, the wineries back in Spain were losing money on their exports to the Americas. Only sacramental wine was allowed to be produced instead. Damn, Chuck. But those, but, those, but some of those Sneaky friars kind of ignored them and still made wines for the people on the sly. It's not like the industry was booming at that point, but they had their own version of bootleggers back in the day. Plus, you're thousands of miles from Chuck's court, and I guarantee you lots of people decided to ignore that law or at least profit from letting people break it. I'm just speculating. It's not like I read anything about that. Anyway, that lasted until the Mexican War of Independence, which was from 1810 to 1821. So somewhere in there, it became legal to make wine. Anyway, Mexico's winemaking history is older than really any other New World country. We just don't think about it much since a couple wars hindered winemaking. It really hasn't had a thriving industry until recently. They went from 25 wineries in 2006 to over 120 as of 2020. One last thing, you know me and maps by now. Mexico doesn't have an appellation system, so it's a Wild West sort of thing. More so than your typical New World country. As a result, there really isn't a map to make like I normally do. So I've created one that just shows the states that have viticulture. There are a couple of versions out there, but this one should be the most comprehensive. Now that I got you caught up enough, let's talk about this wine. It's called El Bajio. It's a collaboration between the importer, La Competencia Imports, and Frischinet. Frischinet. So I've been pronouncing it Frischinet because that's what I thought it was, but I checked the Catalan pronunciation via Google or between a Google Translate and it's Frisch Inet. Anyway, uh, and that's about it. <laughs> anyway, it comes from the Bernal Valley in uh, Queretaro, Mexico. Okay, there's some more. Since it's a collab with Frisch Inet, I'll talk about them some more. They are out of the Catalonian part of Spain, hence the Catalan pronunciation. It was founded in 1861 by Frankesh Sala Ferez in Sant Saderni d'Anoia. I think I got that right, in the Penedes region of Spain. They've become one of the most well-known cava producers in Spain. They have interests in other parts of the world, including Mexico. 
While they pretty much only produce sparkling wines in Spain, and also Prosecco in Italy, they produce a wide range of wines from their winery in Mexico. They started the winery there in 1979 with their first plantings in 1982. This wine appears to be a variation there of their Viña Dolores Brut Reserve, uh, which is also a sparkling wine. Essentially a Mexican version of Cava with the use of Macabeo, Charello, and then they add Uni Blanc, also known as Trebbiano Toscano in Italy. There are multiple variations of Trebbiano, by the way. So let's get into the stats of the wine. So we have the non-vintage El Bajillo sparkling wine. Suggested retail price is around $24.95. It comes from the Val de Bernal uh, area of Mexico. The varieties are 50% Macabeo, 40% Charello, 10% Uni Blanc. It uses the traditional method of sparkling wine, which means the second fermentation happens in the bottle. Aging is 18 to 24 months on lees. The ABV is 11.5%, the pH is 3.5, the total acidity is 5.3 grams per liter, and the dosage is brute listed at 12 grams per liter. Okay, moving on. I'm super excited to finally try this wine. I've had it hot for a hot minute. In fact, it's been so long, I couldn't remember where I got it. I, I did some digging and found out I bought it about two years ago at High Street. This actually will be one of the rare wines that I've actually had before. I truly thought I had bought this from elsewhere, Anyway, I had had a glass of it and I honestly don't remember it other than I must have liked it enough to buy a bottle to take home, mainly because it's German sect. So let's get the backstory on the wine. It's from Maximin, Maximin Grunhauser. They're located in the Mosul in Germany. I had an all too brief trip to the Mosul back in 2019. I hope to go back for a, I hope to go back for a longer time. Winemaking goes back to the Roman times in Germany. There seems to be evidence of wine in the area from that time. The first documentation of wine where the property is dates back to 966 when Emperor Otto I, successor of Charlemagne, confirmed a donation from the 7th century Frankish king Scrooge I. I hope he wasn't really a Scrooge. Anyway, this donation was to the Benedictine Abbey of St. Maximin in Trier. In 1638, a winemaker's house is constructed and some kind of unification to the quote, castle. There is a castle of sorts on the property, not like a King Arthur castle, but more like a large house. The French term is chateau. So chateau, I guess technically is, is, means castle, but a lot of times we call it house for a, a lack of a better translation. Anyway, their website is in German. And while there's a button to view it in English, well, it really doesn't work. So I had the browser translate it. Anyway, there is a secularization by Napoleon at the end of the 18th century, whereby the French government takes over until 1810. In that year, it is sold to Friedrich von Handel. Handel, I guess. It changes hands again in 1882 to Ferdinand uh, Freiherr von Stum Halberg. The winery becomes modernized for the times with the addition of electricity, plus rails are added to the vineyard to help transport grapes. It, you'll see the vineyards at some point if I haven't already shown you. They're steep. That's why you have rails. Anyway, at the end of the 19th century, von Stum's daughter, Ida, received the winery as a dowry for her marriage to Lieutenant General Conrad von Schubert. It's still owned by the family, though it's under the Schubert name. They have three monopole vineyards on the property, Bruderberg, Obstberg, and Herrenberg. There's a total of about 34 hectares planted in these vineyards. All their von Schubert wines come from these vineyards, as far as I can tell. It appears they don't use conventional farming. They mention using natural viticulture, but they don't really have any kind of certifications. As I've said many times, this isn't that unusual, especially for smaller operations. Once the grapes are harvested, they are quickly brought into the winery where they are pressed and put into either oak barrels or stainless steel tanks. They use native yeast for fermentation. All the wood for their barrels come from the property, which is kind of cool. That's not typical, by the way. Now, that's about it. Now, let's talk about the wine stats. All right, so this is the 2013 Maximin Grunhauser Riesling Sect Brut for about 35 bucks. That's what I paid for it. It's from the Mosul. It's from their monopole vineyards, I think. It doesn't specify, but it kind of implies that they have a combination of vineyards as, as from those monopole vineyards. Anyway, Riesling, no percentages, but it must be a minimum of 85% to be a German sect. They do have Pinot Blanc planted in one of the vineyards, so it's possible some of that makes it into the wine because that is allowed. It's Brut, uh, the aging. Uh, I can't find anything specific 
for this vintage, but I did find another vintage that mentions 27 months on the lees. The reserve was 48 months. This is not the reserve. And the ABV is 11%. Okay, now for the third wine. I got this from my distributor friend. We have legit champagne for this one. It comes from Champagne Chapuy. The family has been growing grapes for over 100 years. From what I can tell from their website, they didn't start making wine until 1952. Arnold Chapuy uh, runs the company along with his two daughters. Aurore, Aurore, I guess, is the winemaker and vineyard manager, and, while Elodie, I think I got her name right, um, is the international brand manager. So I mean, she might come over here sometime, <laughs> right? And I'll get to interview her. Anyway, they own a total of eight hectares of vineyards, with most of them being in the Côtes de Blanc uh, region of Champagne. Three hectares are in the Grand Cru village of Augere. The back label has the abbreviation NM, which stands for Negotiant Manipulant. There are five different abbreviations on a champagne label that will indicate the relationship between the source of the grapes and who is making the wine from those grapes. Quote, grower champagne has become the darling of champagne snobs and psalms over the years. It will have an abbreviation, have the abbreviation RM on it, and it stands for Recultant Manipulant. This means that the champagne doesn't, that the champagne house doesn't use any purchased grapes, basically the equivalent of, I guess you'd call it an estate wine. NM champagne is probably the most common type. In the grand scheme of things, there's really nothing wrong with it. Most champagne is made this way. Think about it this way. Some of the best wines in the world, Champagne, Burgundy, Napa Valley, etc., come from grapes that were not farmed by the winery. And while there is something to be said about a winery owning the vineyards and having complete control over everything, Negotiant fruit can be every bit as good. In theory, Considering that they own eight hectares of vineyards, I imagine that their top champagnes will have the RM abbreviation on the label rather than NM. Either way, these guys are not a large champagne house and will most likely be putting a lot of work into all the wines they make. They do pretty standard winemaking, but their website specifically mentions that they don't use centrifuges for clarification, rather they do the normal filtering. Non-vintage wines age two to three years on the lees, while vintage is five years. The minimum for non-vintage in Champagne is 15 months and vintage is 36 months. So they exceed that. Most Champagne, most champagne houses do like Chapuy and, and exceed those minimums. In the vineyards, they are HVE Level 3 certified. This is the official French sustainability certification. This wine doesn't have that certification on the bottle, so the source fruit most likely doesn't meet that standard. With that said, the back label is from the importer and not the winery, so it's possible it meets the standard, but the label wasn't submitted to the TTB for approval. Okay, it's time to get to the stats for the last wine, so here we go. The non-vintage Champagne Chapuy Tradition Brut retails for about $40 to $50. It's a Champagne, the varieties are 50% Chardonnay, 25% Pinot Noir, 25% Meunier. The text sheet is slightly different, but this is what the page for their store says. 49% reserve wines. That's wines from prior vintages. Partial malolactic fermentation. The dosage is 5 grams per liter. This qualifies for extra brut, but they, cho they choose to label it brut. ABV is 12.5%. The production is about 33,000 bottles per year. All right, time to get into the wines. All righty. I'm super excited to try this. I may have mentioned this in the past. As a psalm, you're not supposed to do like I did using the little tab. So I'm going to do like I do a lot of times. So I'm going to pour all three wines at once. That way I can just get into them. I'm really excited about doing this one. Uh, I don't get exposed to a lot of Mexican wines. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I live, <laughs> you think I would living here, but even, even here in San Antonio, we don't get a ton of it. I can tell you that these guys make a, a red wine from a grape called Marcelon, and that grape is fantastic. Um, if you've been watching my stuff recently, and if you haven't, you should, uh, I interviewed Jean-Charles Boisset uh, from Boisset Collection. Also inter uh, interviewed um, Andy Abraham from Shide Family Wines. Um, and the only reason, the reason I mentioned uh, Jean-Charles is that uh, he has a, a partnership with a winery in India that uses Marcelon uh, as one of the grapes. So I'm super excited. I would love to try that sometime. Hopefully they'll send me a bottle. Hint, hint, John Charles, I think I already asked you for that. Anyway, um, 
so Marsalon is a is a hybrid or a cross or whatever, be, not a hybrid, it's a cross between uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Grenache. And I believe it's now an official grape. Uh, it's an official grape in uh, Bordeaux, or it's at least it's at least an experimental grape. They, they they can play around with it. I don't know if it can get into anything quite yet, and it may it may be another couple of vintages before um, before you can uh, do it. But they added I can't remember how many grapes. Maybe I'll remember to put in the lower third. They added. A certain number of grapes because of uh, because of climate change, and uh, Marsalon is one of them. So, woo! There's the champagne. Woo! You know, I op as I opened all three. Right, this was the only one that was aromatic on the start, and it was, and it literally, I'm like, it's champagne. You, you already get the 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 bread part you know the, the the bakery stuff so let's get into the wines you can already tell that the the, the sect has some age it's a little bit golden color i didn't get my white sheet but that's okay yeah here we go i'll use this here's one of my old uh notes so anyway so i mean it's it's got a really yellow color so it's not like super light that's about it. I mean, it's got some good bubbles to it, at least what I saw. Uh, as always, I like to mention this. Um, when I evaluate wines, I always evaluate um, in, in, this, in these glasses. These are the Wine Folly glasses. Um, I like the shape. They look really good. They're a good universal glass in general. Um, but when I evaluate wines, besides doing this, when I drink sparkling wine, I like to drink it out of a glass like this because flutes, all they're good for is making the bubbles look pretty. The bubbles kind of disappear quickly in glasses like this, so they don't doesn't look as pretty. But in, in a in a sparkling wine, the glass I mean I'm sorry, in a flute, the glass is designed so you, it keeps the bubbles going. Anyway, let's check it out. So on the nose, I get some actually uh, some. Maybe it's because I, I see the color yellow. I feel like I'm getting some yellow apple, some yellow fruit here, some peach. Now, you may or may not be able to hear the train. The the noise reduction I've been using. Um, with this audio program I, I use to edit everything is great at eliminating noise, but man, I can hear the train like a, you know what, it was loud today. But there's like a bruised apple, like a bruised golden apple going on with this. I mean, I don't know how long it's been oxidized or how long it's been, um, I'll, I'll get to this here in a second. I'll just get to it now. Um, actually in one of the other episodes, I haven't recorded them yet. I think I talk about dosage. I'm sorry. Uh, let's talk about, um, uh, when something's been disgorged. So when you age something on the lees, it, it slows down the aging, right? The lees are sucking out all the oxygen uh, in the wine. So the wine isn't oxidizing. But when you disgorge it, and all three of these are made in a traditional method. So it ages on lees for a certain amount of time, and then they pop the cork or most likely pop a crown cap from this, this bottle. And then a little bit of wine gets, gets shot out because the second fermentation has happened. And then they put a little more wine in there. That's your dosage. Sometimes it's, you know, has a little bit of extra sugar. Sometimes it doesn't. And then they put the actual cork in there. And at that point, the wine is starting to do its actual oxidizing. Okay. So depending on when this was, it might say on the back. Sometimes they say it, sometimes they don't. Uh, it just gives me a lot number. It doesn't tell me when it was disgorged, but that's okay. A lot of sparkling wines don't do it, especially not vintage. But I do get a little bit of bakery thing, not a whole lot. It's more fruit and a little bit of, I guess, yeastiness, a little bit of floral, but it smells a little oxidized. So let's check it out. Hmm. It's kind of cool. So that yellow apple and pear really come through right now. I also get a little bit of a touch of orange. And, and um, um, like some, kind of a tropical fruit thing going on, like guava, mango. And there's a kind of a spice component. And I, I'm, I'm having a hard time identifying the actual spice. It's almost like an incense, really. It's almost like incense is in there. That's cool. I don't think I've ever had it in a sparkling wine. So somebody uh, I ran into a few days ago um, had this wine and one person really liked it. The other person didn't. So there you go. 
So I like it. So you got, I get two, you get two votes for liking it. The other person, I guess, you know, they're not as adventurous as we are. Yeah, it's like, it's like getting a caramelized apple. So you got the little oxidation going on. Caramelized or, or caramel apple, yellow apple. And you're like hanging out in the head shop, eating it. Okay. You know, got the incense burning. Not quite patchouli, but yeah. And it's, it's got, it's really bright and crisp. Um, my mouth is watering. You know, it, it's, it's really, really, I think, well-made. It's delicious. It, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it was 12 grams per liter for the dosage. So that's at the upper limit of brute. Though the EU, the, you'll find places where they say 15. But as far as I know, it's all now 12. 15 is the old version of brute, 0 to 15. But I believe everybody's now universal, 0 to 12 is brute. Um, so this is that right at that, right at that break point of brute and extra brute. And, uh, sorry, brute and extra dry, which is weird because extra dry you think would be drier, but it's sweeter. But um, yeah, it, it's got a freshness, got a fruitiness. It's definitely more fruit than bakery stuff. Like I'm sure this is going to be more like bakery, like croissant and, and, and pastry. But this one's more of that fruit forward thing. Not truly sweet, but just a sweetness of fruit. I think it tastes really good. All right, let's move on to the sect. So like a really deep golden color. You know, it's definitely obvious, some obvious oxidation going on. So I had this literally almost two years ago to the day I'm recording. This is November, um, whatever, November 14th. So, and I think I had it like November 14th or 20th, whatever, two years ago in 2020. Um, would have been, yeah, I guess it's 2020. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's like a really deep golden color. The bubbles are more prominent here. So this one, the bubbles kind of disappeared really quick. The bubbles are more prominent here. The champagne is is still kicking. All right, I can. I mean, it's really active. All right, so let's uh, take a take a little sniff here. Oh, yes, Riesling with almost ten years of age. So this is unmistakably Riesling. It's weird because I don't drink a lot of sect. And this is, it's unusual for me to drink sec with this much age. Granted, I had it two years ago, so it was two years younger. But you have that earthy mushroom thing. Here's the funny thing. I, I enjoy mushroom, I guess, if you want to call it that, on wine. But I don't like eating mushrooms. I don't like the aroma of mushrooms. I don't like the taste of mushrooms. I don't like how they feel. But the earthy kind of more, it's not really mushroom specifically. It's that forest floor but super earthy with like comp compost type of thing, right? That's really what it is. So you get that, you get like this sweet, I mean, it's kind of a decaying thing, but it's, I get like really sweet uh, smelling or really like highly oxidized or rotten apple. This is a good thing. And, and I get like pasta water. So it's got the bakery thing going on, the Lee's, even though it's been off the lees for probably quite a while, you still sm you're smelling what the lees did to it. Yeah, and almost like a yellow pepper, kind of like kind because of, like yellow peppers are kind of sweet. Um, they're not like peppery necessarily, but you have that. Yeah, it reminds me of like a yellow, like more like yellow peppers. A lot of yellow thing going on here. A little bit of white flour, but yeah, also a little bit of green apple to it. Let's check it out. <laughs> You know, if this was the last episode I was recording, I'd be drinking these. But this is the first episode of three, and I have seven more wines to do. Anyway, maybe because I'm doing all three sparkling wines, and I'm going to transition into white, then red, then I'm going to do... Then I do, the other two episodes have white and red, so... It tastes good. Anyway, um, you've got that You've got that earthy forest floor compost... Um, mushroomy fruit, you know, that, that, that kind of baked overripe, you know, over oxidized, uh, fruit basket going on here. You've got grape, you've got yellow apple, you've got peach, you've got ma mango. I want to even say you got a little bit of banana in here. Um, orange, you know, this is stuff that has got that really, really overripe flavor to it. Not sweetness overripe, but the flavor, right? I'm so oxidized. But especially on the on the pomaceous fruit, the you know, the apple type of thing, caramelization. Yeah, 
It's also a broadness to it, even though it's really acidic. It's a broadness to it. Because we're using such a high acid grape already, it's it's helping preserve it. But you're getting that you're getting a little smoothness out of it. It's kind of like a coating the mouth type of thing. Not too much spice. The pasta water isn't so much. I don't get the you know the the the, the wet pasta, raw pasta, you know, um, or you know soft pasta, not like the hard. But I don't get a lot of that on the palate necessarily. But yeah, I mean this would be a great dish with like a pasta, like if you're going to have like a, an Alfredo dish or whatever, man, I need to save this for Thanksgiving because we're having Paisano stuff. We're going to eat in about a week, a little over a week, right? So um, yeah. So next week is thing. Oh, maybe two weeks to Thanksgiving. Anyway, I don't know if these will survive with my little, um, whatchamacallits here, how long they'll survive. Um, but they'll last at least a week, but I don't know if it will, it'll last all the way till actual Thanksgiving, but this would be a great wine to do with with that stuff. Yeah. With like, especially with like, um, like a lemon sauce, like, uh, so what I usually get is a, as a, a, it was called veal Christina. It's an off the menu item. Uh, it's, it's not quite like a veal piccata, but it is like a lemon, like a creamy lemon sauce. So if you just like Alfredo with this, yeah. Pesto sauce. Pff, yeah. Be great with this. Super tasty. All right. Got a little worried because the remote wasn't showing anything, but everything's still going good. All right. Now the legit champagne. And when I say legit champagne, I'm not trying to make light of or, or put down these other wines. It's just that people tend to use, oh, well, yeah, you can see whoo, sunlight right there. Um, people tend to use the word champagne as a generic thing. Whereas I try to always make sure I'm being very specific on the type of sparkling wine we're talking about. So yeah, I mean, the bakery stuff is there, but I got some really, really fresh uh, fruit going on here. I've got apple, green apple, a little bit of grape, a little bit of white grape going on. Almost like that, almost like a fruit cup thing. We get that little bit of syrup thing, a little bit of peach, like canned peaches. A little bit of like sandalwood, like fresh wood thing going on. Yeah, and that brioche, that, that croissant, pastry thing going on is much more prominent on this than the other two. And the bubbles are still going. Right, let's taste it. So between the three, and this is what makes champagne champagne, even though they all use effectively the same method. And this one is probably just as young as this one, right? Champagne has a certain mouthfeel. The bubbles just are different. It's just, it's hard. I don't know why. It's just hard to replicate the, the mousse, as they call it, the bubbles, how fine they are and how much they coat and all that. It's just hard. I mean, I get this one's a little bit older, so it's not going to have as much uh, carbonation left to it. So that's the only problem with drinking aged uh, sparkling wine is that it's going to start losing its carbonation, but it's still going to taste delicious. This one just didn't have the same mouthfeel. Mmm. This is killer. The spice component is really coming through, but it now tastes like a, a still wine. It doesn't have as much carbonation to it, but there's like that the spice and, and incense thing and lavender and hand soap in a floral good way, but like, you know, wood and, wood and floral. God, man, that's really good. Anyway, back to this one. There's a little bit of um, sharpness to it, a little bit of attack. It's super bright. It's still really acidic. Um, it tastes wonderful. You've got all that apple, the orange, the, you've got some peach in there. Um, you've got a little bit of floral thing going on there, a little bit of white flowers. Um, again, you've got that, you've got that, uh, bakery pastry thing happening. And then the mouthfeel, it's just, it's just, it's so satisfying because it just coats the mouth with all the bubbles. Super delicious, man. You are not going to go wrong with any of these wines. Now, it's going to be hard to find this one specifically because I've had it for two years. So you might be able to find a 15 or maybe a 16, 17 or 18. Um, you know, you'll find a newer one. It just won't, have, won't be as oxidized. So you won't have all that wonderful bruised fruit thing going on. This one, it kind of depends. The importer, it, it's a thing with the importer. They don't import to a lot of other states besides Texas. That they, I know they do a couple other states. 
maybe more, maybe a few other states. I just don't know how widely available this is. I picked it because it's so cool and unusual, and that's what I'm all about. This one it might be a little bit harder. Also, it's not your a common one. Um, it's a distributor who handles a lot of small specialty stuff. So it may not be hard, may not be easy to find. The idea with tying this is find something really cool and unusual, get some German sec and get some champagne and have a great time with your New Year's Eve. Absolutely, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this year's New Year's Eve special. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell all your friends. And I'll see you next time. Cheers with the sect. Cheers.